the, what the family dynamic was. Yeah. And it sounds to me like if you're talking about a kid with a ceiling, the kid from the four lines team likely has more of a ceiling because he's he's had to deal with some measure of adversity. Um, maybe he likes it, maybe he doesn't, but in some way he's dealing with it. And conversely, when that other boy goes to a higher level and isn't maybe top six, yeah. probably falls apart or has difficulty adjusting to that role, whereas the other the other kid has already sort of that's already sort of been not taken care of, but dealt with a bit for you. Yeah, it, it sounds like that kid has a higher ceiling because I think we all know how confidence and uh, confusion and hey, I've never been in this situation before can really set a kid back until they get that figured out. Yeah, the the coach of the the kid on the four line is he played he played in the National Hockey League. His father played pro hockey. They both played at the University of Minnesota. So, in fact, his dad was on the U.S. national team about 100 years ago, but and and scouted for Montreal for years. And so they've got you know high quality coaches. And then the coach, I know the coach really well. And I was talking to him last night. And he says this is just a quality family. The parents don't interfere. Um, his dad says whatever, whatever the journey is, is what it's going to be. <laughs> and he's he's happy. And I. You know, I don't, I don't mean to be critical of the other side, but, you know, I know that world really well also because I know so many families and kids that came out of that other school who, again, live, you know, whose families, you know, the parents are CEOs of, you know, the largest private company in the world and dad shows up in a Ferrari. And I was standing with a, a, a scout from Central Scouting watching and him play a few years ago, this kid play. And I said, what do you think? He's pretty good. And he goes, yeah, but to your point, Peter, you know, he doesn't have to play hockey. So when it gets tough, he won't. Right. But yeah, that makes sense. So I've sort of always remembered that. And, and he's a guy I respected. He coached the, he, I coached against him in the USHL for three or four years. And, he was he was a quality coach for sure, and I think he did a great job as a scout. So, it's just interesting the dynamics of looking at these kids and trying to figure out who's got upside and who's gonna who's gonna flame out first and end up like us in beer league. It's just a point of win. <laughs> there you go, hey, Tom. Thank you for sending me your stats, your passing stats. <laughs> those are good. I enjoyed those. So. Yeah, I think that that one mother does those. I, I think it tells you a lot if you uh, want to look at who's passing, where shots are coming from, who's getting shots. Yeah. Do, do you take the stats? You have somebody do it. Oh, there's a mother who sits in the stands and does it. <laughs> and then she takes a picture of it, sends it to me after the period, and erases it and does the next period. Oh, cool. So that's... I have the picture of it. So that's how I could send it to you. Oh, thank you. I appreciate Better it. Better than sheets of paper that you got to keep track of, eh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hell, I'd like to add that <clears throat> the particular mother is a very vocal one. Uh, <laughs> and having her do that task has totally occupied her. She knows the game. Yep. Uh, I've actually been in the stands and uh, heard her shouting and coaching from the stands. And everything she's saying is good. Yeah. <laughs> she knows her stuff, but uh, this is a real good task for her, and Tom has put it to good use. Yeah. It's actually had a tremendous impact on how well the team is passing. Um, the consciousness of the pass and the stats on a daily basis, uh, it sort of correlates with what Cassie Campbell's mom, who came to the... Uh, parent meeting we had creating a mission statement and she shared a story with Cassie growing up that she would most parents provide a loony or a toony in Canada that's one or two dollars for a goal and she provided uh, a loony a dollar for assists and uh, she brought that point up at the parent meeting and 
I think it's really a significant thing because uh, their passing is unreal, but they still have players who go coast to coast and don't see open players and uh, should pass, but don't. Uh, and with all the skill developments going on, it's more one-on-one -on -one focused. And as Tom says, the game is one on five. So now listen, with Tim on, uh, hell, it, the situation you described, you're recruiting. And um, uh, there, there's one family that's very well to do that you're wondering about. Uh, you know, the player may be spoon fed and not have the intangibles that a middle class kid might have and a, a family with less. Um, you know, that that makes sense. But I want to just mention that uh, there are some players in the NHL like that who have uh, been totally supported and been able to afford the best private help in the world. And, and uh, they did get to the top. I don't know if it affected their character character or not growing up, but uh, I think we have to be careful. Um, there's an awful lot of CEOs with, you know, quality uh, values in their upbringing and uh, trans, you know, they, they don't get there without some degree of leadership acumen and values driven um, things behind their motivation to succeed so uh, you know it sounds like the choice to choose the kid that has the intangibles uh, looks like a, a no-brainer but sometimes I think we've got to be careful when we prejudge things based on that and probably do a little more research but I don't know so uh, can you let Tim know that situation again hell just for our sake Tim, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. My For some reason, my camera's not working today. I like the hat, Tim. <laughs> uh, Hal, your, mic, your mic's off, Hal. Well, he slipped off, but um, Peter, I wonder if you could describe the scenario of what he said, and with Tim here, maybe repeat your comment. Okay, so what I'll try to paraphrase it, I guess, uh, as best I can. He's got two recruits that he's looking at, and they come from different uh, social economic type backgrounds. One's very wealthy, goes to an expensive private school. The other is uh, average working class family. Um, the boy who plays on the expensive, more prep team, I think it is is a kid who has a ton of points but plays all the time uh, the team doesn't run four lines whereas the other boy has i think he said similar point production but plays that team rolls four lines so the question was which player should he take and why mm. seems and seems like a no-brainer to me it 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 does. I mean, it it does. I mean, and it, it it's funny, and maybe it's because, you know, I am sixty six years old. But I'll ask the question to the group: um, If you were stuck on a desert island and you had to pick one of those two kids, it was just you and him. Which kid would you pick? Hmm. Yeah. Again, I seems like a no brainer. I'll I take my chances with the uh, less privileged the less privileged kid. Um. You know, the, obviously, uh, hockey-wise, there's probably got to be a bit more of a difference and be interesting to see. You know, it depends what you're looking for, you know, to help your team be the best it can. But, you know, with all things being equal, I don't think there's any question that I would prefer to take the less privileged kid. You're just more apt to have problems with not just maybe not the kid, but the parents of the more privileged kid. Yeah, I mean, and my, my, I guess the point I made was, I mean, I agree with you. And a big part of it for me was it doesn't sound like the the kid who is, is the more privileged kid has had much to deal with his regards to adversity. And as yeah. you go higher up the totem pole, uh, no matter how good you are, there's typically someone 
as good or better than you. So your role might change. And if you're not used to being in a situation where you do play uh, a four lines and you get your opportunities, and you make the most of them when you get them, you just you just get them. That might be really difficult for that player mentally to develop in that type of situation. But that's the reality of what happens, right? I mean, who knows better than you, right? When you when you're you and you are in that world. Yeah, I totally agree. Like, uh, it sounds like, you know, the it's, it's kind of funny to characterize them as less privileged, more privileged, but that's, uh, but yeah, it looks like, it sounds like, you know, that player has the, already has the baked in um, to some degree, um, hopefully accepts the team value of using four lines and, you know, it just points to less problems in that area um, where you could have significant problems with the other with the other player. If even if he was playing well and you didn't give him as much ice as he used to, or if you get to a point where he's not playing well, you have to reduce his ice, then you're way more apt to have problems, I would say, uh, with, with that, with the more privileged player. And, you know, like you said, it just seems like a total no brainer to me. Yeah. Right. And depending on what situation you go to, what team you go to, right? Like you might have a kid like that. Maybe he's got, got a, a really high end skill set, and the, uh, the coach says, I, I love your anticipation, your IQ, your skill set. You're going to kill penalties for me because, mm-hmm. and then, well, wait a minute. I I'm always been on the power play. What are you talking about? Oh yeah. Right. Tim, I I just wanted to ask Jordan and Tom, I I don't know that we've experienced, uh, you know, I know by working at the private school Edge in Calgary, um, we had a boy on our team, Ted, uh, Tim, whose parents were American with absolute character. I'm sure he had to be pretty well to do to be in the Edge program because it costs a lot of money, but absolute quality kid and quality parents and uh of course we developed everybody and played all the lines so we had no no problems but i'm curious jordan and tom and in your coaching have you experienced this dilemma of um you know and and i'm sure some of those uh people with a lot of money have donated to the school with expectations of ice time for their kid. And that is another struggle. And I know, Jordan, you've experienced pressure uh, of that type, and I'm just not sure whether it was um, families that were more well-to-do or less well-to-do. So, Jordan, can you comment on that? Well, I think that part of it, Wally, comes back to... uh... Um, well, we're talking about character. You're hearing character thrown around here and, and, uh, character is something that's built over time. And, and I know that there's, uh, adversity was something that Peter said that I, I clung to there that if a player or a person, uh, does not, uh, handle adversity or, or has never faced adversity, that's that's where we were run into trouble. Uh, it doesn't matter what economic background they come from. Um, I work in a very socioeconomic diverse school in that uh, there's people coming from multi-million dollar homes on the lake to uh, ones that are are renting homes and are brand new Canadians. Um, so it's it's uh, comes down to whether the parents uh, allow their children to handle challenges themselves or they take them all away and and uh child psychologist dr alex russell talked about that with uh uh he what he said his american colleagues called them snowplow parents where parents push everything out of the way but he said i call them zamboni parents because not only do they take and and take all the obstacles away but they also leave the path behind them pristine so it's uh, the whole idea that instead of preparing the child for the path, we prepare the path for the child now and uh, in many ways. And so that's, that's where uh, I find this to be a little bit interesting in that 
uh, on the female side of the game, there are girls that'll get all the way, well, and on the male side too, to some extent, they'll get all the way up to uh, U15, U18, uh, AAA hockey and never have felt adversity, never been released from a team. And depending on the coaching that they've received, like, like you said, Peter, they may be getting preferential ice time. And so then it's on to a coach that has to uh, put them through some of that adversity or some of that pressure that they have never felt before. And, and uh, if they're not prepared for it, it's, it's going to, going to implode. And, and you know that their parents, if they've never allowed their child to, to be challenged, um, they're not going to be very supportive either. So that's the, the bigger question. And it's a hard thing to figure out is uh, what, uh, what resiliency these kids will have and what resiliency their parents will let them have. So, uh, or have helped them to build. So uh, that's a, it's a much bigger question as to whether they're going to be a, a great center or a good D or, or whatever. It's, uh, it's going back to that character thing that, that Peter was first talking about there. So I don't know whether I answered your question, Wally, but I think that uh, um, <clears throat> it's something that uh, I know in the last couple of years in my coaching that I've looked at more and more is how the players interact with one another at camp and uh, what character pieces, are they cheating drills? Are they, are they doing everything uh, that's asked of them? And uh, I think that, that tells me a lot more uh, in many ways. And we should, we should probably put the disclaimer in that, you know, we're, we're not saying that <clears throat> every kid who comes from a kind of privileged background is gonna be a problem, nor are all the parents gonna be problems as Wally pointed out. And the vice versa is true, just because you maybe come from a lower economic background, um, you know, plenty of those kids have struggles of their own and as do the parents. I mean, we're just talking generalities here. And, um, and really the answer for Hal is he probably needs to interview the kids and the parents and figure out, get a sense of, you know, what, what the better, uh, packages for for his group because you know you really shouldn't assume one thing or the other just because of where they come from we all know that's really not um not wise really if you're trying to do the best thing yeah and it works both ways right there's yeah. a fit, there's a fit for that player and his family as well as the fit for <clears throat> the, the team that he's going to or he or she are going to yeah like if like for instance if i don't know if hal's listening like if he uh, did sit down with the the parents and, and and the player, both groups, both both sides, and said to them, "Hey, here's how I operate. I like to use four lines. And if you're not playing well, and you used to be on the power play, but if you're not playing well, you might not be on the power play. Might put somebody else in there. You know, I mean, you know, it's possible that both sets would say, no, nah, we don't want that." Um, but they, it's also uh, possible that one of the uh, sets of parents and players would say, yeah, you know what, we, we don't like that. Uh, we, you know, our kid's a great player and he needs to be on the power play. And there's your answer right there. Tim, I put my hand up because Hell is working with a team in the BC Hockey League. And he's talking about two players that are being recruited for the uh, junior program there so it's it's not that the coach it doesn't have a philosophy or hell would do the interview but the information he's gathering and i think the conversations to be had uh there's sort of a third party in here and hell's just sort of a scout making a recommendation with uh as he mentioned players with very good statistics and he did, as you said, Tim, made assumptions that the wealth of uh, the one family and um, the kids, that particular player might have gotten more ice time. But I think I'd really want to identify the the facts of that first. And uh, I go back to the uh, Ed School experience. Uh, and hell, you've missed about 15 minutes. I don't know if you're on, but it was all about your topic. And it's, I'll, I'll, I'll edit it for you and send Thank it you. back back to you 
Um, but both Tim and I worked at a, a prep school here where, you know, I think 30,000 Canadians, the cost, and <clears throat> there are really good players from wealthy families who can afford to put kids in the program. And I know one in particular that uh, uh, I coached the UFC, uh, owned a number of dealerships across, car dealerships across Canada, quality character guy, uh, daughter was a captain on the team and totally supportive of doing things the right way. In fact, was frustrated with the, with the way that particular coach shortened the bench mm-hmm. and didn't hold people accountable for behaviors. A uh, very wealthy family, but definitely uh, one that supported the cause. So, uh, Tim, with with hell back on, I think it's you know you you might be able to summarize what you've said related to uh, a caution about decision making here. Well. Um, I mean, in a nutshell, Hal, again, and, you know, on the surface, it looks like a no-brainer. You know, generally speaking, you know, the, the more working-class kid is more likely to have good values. And if he's, if he, like, he's used to adversity, he's used to playing on a four-line team, it seems like a no-brainer. But the bottom line is, for me, and I would want this of any scout that I'm looking for, if you're going to recommend a player... You know, maybe you just need to have a chat with both both groups and say, hey, here's our coach. This is what his philosophy is. This is how he works. Like, he likes to use four lines. He likes to find rules for people. If you're used to being on the power play, that's fine. But if you're not playing well, then somebody else might be on the power play. And, you know, you might find one of the sets of parents say, ah, no, our kid needs to be on the power play, like, blah, 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 blah. So they might make the decision for you. But, um, and again, there's, there's the, uh, sort of the preface that, you know, just because someone's from a more privileged background or a less privileged background doesn't dictate whether they're good people, bad people, problem people or whatever. Uh, so that alone is not really enough to, you know, sort of make the decision on, you know, it'd be good for you to have a quick conversation with both of them and just see how they react, um, because that might answer your question. I think that's kind of a summary of. Yeah, that's that's great advice. Go ahead, and, Peter. Uh, yeah, and I'll just kind of piggyback on that because with my again, I was high level uh, prep school for eleven years, and we always made the parents a part of the conversation. Just because you know the best way, old saying, right? The best way to end a marriage is when you start it. You make sure you try to get everything out there out like. It's okay to disagree, right? It's okay to to be in different camps if it works for you. If, that's why when you go to the parking lot and you go shopping, there's not black and white Chevrolets. There's every color car, every brand, because everybody wants something a little different. It's the key, like Tim is saying, is trying to find people that will be on the same page because that not only makes the team better, but at the end of the day, it makes you better as a scout because if there is any nonsense, you're the guy that's going to hear about why did you recommend this kid, right? right. So yeah. you yourself a, a, a bit of a conversation, so at least you're feeling good about that and that you're confident in your choice and how you can back it up the best you can back it up. And I think that's all great information. Hey, thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. Uh, speaking on that, <clears throat> excuse me, I brought in a player at SATE. And I asked a guy I knew in the where from Vancouver about her character and all this kind of stuff, and he said, "Good." And uh, she just caused so many problems. I talked to one of the players who was an affiliate with that team, and she said, "Oh, I came on the team, and she was yelling at me on the bench." And and I and uh, a little bit bugged with that uh, guy for telling me that she was salt of the earth person. So you you gotta watch that as a you know, to make sure you don't recommend someone that's gonna be pain in the rear for the other issue we've got down here is because the NCAA uh decided that you know to keep amateur status you can't have an agent, but you can have an advisor. 
and created a whole network <laughs> of, of people who are charging like $8,000 a year to be the family advisor. And a lot of these guys don't really have much hockey experience from, or limited that I can tell. And then they've got a stable of 20 players. They're paying them eight grand a year. And so the one kid came highly recommended. I don't know by who, but I'm sure it's his family advisor who's shopping him around to junior teams around, you know, in North America. So I got to find out more about that also. And I don't have any problem going over and talking to the kid and, and hooking up. We have talked to the parents of the kid, you know, the other kid that plays on four lines and, um, you know, it's, uh, so we'll have to go through that before we, we get very yeah, far. The, the parents it's are, awful are, lot of work to bring one or two kids up, up, up onto it. The parents are probably a bit less of an issue if you're sending the kids up to trail to play junior. I mean, it's, it would be more the kids themselves um, but you get a sense of the kids, obviously, if you talk to the parents. But, um, you know, when there's that much distance between them, um, they can still cause problems. But since they're not in-house talking to all the other parents every game, then they're less of an issue than if you're talking about a prep school team where the parents all drink coffee and beer together yep. four times a week. I just All those safety meetings. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, and this is probably more from movies and uh, good coaches. I'm talking college uh, football coaches recruiting. I don't know how many movies where uh, the coaches actually visit the family. And based on the interaction with the parents and the quality of life of the family, that becomes sort of the the crux of their recruiting. Now, it's a little different being a scout, but home homework has got to be vital, and I think every one of us has been guilty of not doing the homework. And I know every one of us, and, and I jo uh, Jordan's encountered, he's listened to good advice but hasn't taken it because he thought he could deal with that particular player or family, and it did backfire. So I, I think getting to know the family and whether it's movies or reality, uh, the fact is the respect the kid shows towards the family and uh, it's evident in, in a visitation in terms of the interaction. And uh, I'm not sure if a scout has the, um, you know, the uh, a, ability or freedom to arrange that kind of a thing. Uh, but I know as a head college recruit, when you're talking big dollars and cents, in some cases, they're flying those kids in and spending hundreds, $100,000 on the family coming in to be recruited. Adios. And the perspective of uh, trying to buy that player and the expectations of the family once they're there, I question the, the recruitment process relative to the delivery process of what they are going to develop relative to team or individual conflicts that, oh. that occur. And, and Hal, uh, when you began, you, you were describing situations with your club team at your school they're far more serious than this. They're important. This is important. But the fact that, um, you know, there's another lawsuit on another issue, uh, those kind of things are occurring at the community level where these are still kids under 18 mm -hmm. and parents are involved and I don't believe money's involved. Right. But the upbringing and the expectations of uh, what is your program about and the philosophy and the understanding of where you're going with what you're doing and not being able to do it. That's basically what's happening. You just, yeah. your hair is going to get grayer and pretty soon you're going to lose it. So 
that to me, you know, it is the issue. Um, but the question you asked, I'm not sure, you know, like, like Tim said, it, it sounds like a no brainer, but doing the research is important. And just like doing the mission statement is important. Nope. What are they, how does the parents raise in the family to bringing up the kid in terms of their expectations, how they're going to be treated? Um, are they going to be entitled or are they going to earn what the, they deserve? Right. And the other, the other way you can obviously do it, Hal, is just say to the, <coughs> the GM in trail, hey, there's two kids here. They're both similar type players. They're both good players. They both can produce. And then let them do the interviews because in some ways that would be better if the coach had, you know, uh, I mean, coach had a conversation with both of them about how he likes to coach and everything else. So you're not boxing yeah. him in or putting him in a spot he doesn't want to be in uh, by saying something that maybe doesn't truly reflect uh, how he coaches. So, I mean, that's sort of a good way to go too. Well, I think I'm going to, um, with the, with the, kid that's playing on the four lines. I just sent his coach a note um, with the link to the trails uh, spring camp in April. And we talked about that last night and I said, you know, would he be willing to go up there and, you know, with, and, and go up and skate for a couple of days and see the place and talk to the coaches. And he said, yeah, yeah he probably would. Um, I said, well, that, that to me makes a lot of sense. Oh yeah. Um, I don't, I don't think the coach, you know, I mean, they're they're still playing. They're going to be playing for another another month probably, and they're in second to the last place. So there's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of angst, and um, but uh, and I'll you know we'll do the same thing with the other kid if I can track down. I want to track down his advisor and see who who he's working with and have a conversation there. And I do know the coach, but the coach and I don't see eye to eye about things. And so. if he's not willing to go, then there's your answer right there. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think that's, you know, and they could, they have another camp out east. So, you know, they don't have to go to trail. They could go out east. And if that, if that doesn't suit them to go skate, you know, and, and see what it's like, then, then they can go to the USHL or go somewhere, you know, somewhere else and see what it's like. So. Well, great. This was fun. I enjoyed I enjoyed the ideas and the and the thought process, and um, we'll go from there. So, Peter, go ahead, Peter. Yeah, no, I was just gonna uh, just mention, ask Hal, do you have a good rapport relationship with the trail coach in regards to the type of kid he looks for? Not, I'm not talking about talent and that because that's yeah. probably easy. Like the type of kid that fits their culture. Probably not. Um, the owner, the owner of the team is is a is, is a friend. I know him. I coached his son, um, but you know they're up in Trail, and I'm here. The owner lives in Florida and in Trail, um, although he has a house here, but he's not here very much. Um, and we've had some meetings, and I I interact mostly with the assistant coach, who's the head of you know looking for high end. You know, aren't we all? We're looking for high-end forward impact forwards that can score goals, and and, and yeah. solid and, and one or two more solid T. Uh, and so, um, I have, but I have met some kids that played up there, and they love it. They thought the whole environment was great. Uh, this was unsolicited. I just ran into them in a coffee shop and. I was wearing my trail hat, and they uh, their eyes just lit up, and and we chatted, and they're they're sort of mid level D one players. They've bounced around since they left juniors, but they couldn't say enough good things about it. So now, yeah, that, and that's right. That that finding that kind of kid because also there's that piece for that player, uh, a culture shock, right? Depending upon what the the geog geography setup is in trail compared yeah, to yeah. if you live in, uh, you know, the Gold Coast, of Connecticut, we'll say, you know. Yeah, lots of kids aren't, aren't lots of kids aren't used to having to work in a coal mine as their part time jobs. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's true. Yeah. 
Well, the kids are basically sleeping indoors for good behavior. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Listen, I, I, I want to mention a, a real situation. Female hockey, same, same scenario. And I am advised the parents at the time to do their homework before they choose the school. School the daughter was going to, Division One NCAA. And of course, out here just being invited is almost. Well, I was, where can I sign? And <clears throat> the girl was a, a national team U18 player here, very talented. Uh, Tom coached her. She uh, went down there with high expectations. The philosophy of the coach was the, the veterans played the power play in special teams, and she was a first-year player, and so she didn't get much ice time relative to special teams and she was one of those players who when she was in bantam before tom coached her in midget she was entitled by the coach in that minor hockey system and played to the point of being injured and played injured and as a result had to do about three months of rehab in the off season so mentally she went in with expectations she entered a a school that had a philosophy of coaching where the power plays were given to the older experienced players. I'm not sure if it's more talented or not. I didn't question that. But they have to do the research too, and they didn't. And so the, the school's program folded. It started again. The girl returned to Canada to play uh, in the university league here in um, Calgary, and everything's fine. Um, but they go through life making choices. And um, the, the choices, they're making a choice too. And they have to do their research on that coach, how he's going to coach, relative to how they've been coached, and what the expectations are. I think it's just being honest and upfront uh, so that trust and respect can be the underlying um, you know, modus operandum for everyone. Oh, well, good. Well, I'm, uh, I want to welcome Mike, Michael. Uh, yesterday, I, uh, we had a live cadence coffee session. I wish you all could have been there. There was Tom Malloy, Steve Carlisle, and myself. And Tom, I think, Started at 8.30 and we, we broke up at about 11.30. Uh, and just you and I were the last two standing. And uh, Tom, um, after some cajoling by me, uh, said, to, okay, Wally, you can run the uh, Uri Krolix 210 slash one continuous progression for scoring. So for those of you that don't know, Yuri Krolik uh, from the uh, Czech Republic played in two Olympics as a goalie. And to uh, Dominic Hasek was his backup. So he had a goaltending <laughs> background. And the way I got to meet him was coaching the Oval team. Uh, Thomas Pacina uh, assisted me, and then he took over the team. Tim coached with him. But after the 2002 Olympics, Thomas was able to arrange a developmental exchange where both he and I went to the Czech Republic, spent 10 days with a club team studying a club operation from the professional right down to the youth level to see what they did. In return, we didn't contribute anything. We just observed and stole and borrowed. But they sent Yuri over here. And he did a coaching slash scoring clinic. And the what a concept. A goalie, now instructing goalies, teaching, scoring, and goaltending at the same time. Oh. So his progression, and I have, I, I did a summary paper of about five pages explaining his theory. It's brilliant. And the drill progression that I'm going to do with Tom, I'm going to have that, uh, Michael, that Mike working. On the way home, I drove by the arena and I said, 
oh, I'm going to go see if somebody there can help me set it up. And you wouldn't believe it. The, the rink manager there got so excited. He was a techie of techies. Oh, perfect. And he got it going. And uh, I'm looking forward to experimenting with that and with that drill sequence to see how uh, it works. Because I did it last week with Wes Jardine and his team. And it went surprisingly well. But he has to repeat it. And he's going to in the practice this Sunday. Because basically they learned how to run the drill in that practice. Now accomplishing its purpose, that's the next phase. So uh, it, for me, it's just everything I do is an experiment here in life. And I'm really thankful for that opportunity. So um, I don't know if anybody has anything to add on the uh, rec recruitment, uh, the entitlement, the uh, character, the intangibles. Uh, but uh, I know I had a couple questions to initiate conversations uh, later, but uh, anybody else got any thoughts on what we've been talking about to this point? Okay, I'm, I'm going to share with you, I'm uh, Alan Andrews, who uh, <clears throat> my age, he's run a hockey school, and it's a 36 day a year operation for 40 years. His son has taken over the operation. Every notable prof and a pro professional player in Atlantic Canada has attended that school at some point in time. And now uh, he, I think they have a staff of a full time 15 people. L, like myself, is just retired, but he still works with U9 kids and he worked with them I think for the last 20 years and that's when it was all whole ice hockey and his conversation with me yesterday as I was driving to the coffee house I wish he was on and I would have recorded because he's done everything that needs to be done at that age on the ice, technically, with fundamental skills that I don't think any of us have ever done at that age with success. But he's also done something that none of us have even tried with leadership development at a U9 level. And they're, they're doing things like reading chapters out of leadership books, summarize them, publicly speaking to one another in the dressing room about them. Uh, for instance, he he talked about on the drive, his U9 kids, he told them to go home and Google the word triangulation. And then they came back and they had their definitions. And then he related it to it. And this is U9s. And they got it. He said, we don't know how brilliant they are. So, you know, it's no wonder Crosby and McKinnon have achieved the level they have because they were there when they were four years old and just fundamental skills. Tom, I, the question I had for you on the fundamental skills is, and I think you must have done it, but he teaches a, uh, front foot uh, stop at Tifa and T-start. There's, there's just no way he teaches the front two foot stop and crossover start. It's biomechanically, really has no place in the game except over skating a situation. So you have to put the brakes on and get the hell going the other way. So that's something fundamental. And Tom, I watch your kids in games, not cross their feet, keep your toe cap square. So I was thinking you must have worked on that. Did you? I could have, I've worked on so much stuff. Yeah. I think in a skating sequence, we have a skating sequence we do. Yeah. And, you know, just uh, that would be part of it. Yeah. Well. And I was on there one practice doing uh, the warm-up, and that's part of the, that. Yeah. Well, I, I, t I think I've told everybody the story of the Flames doing lightning, and 
you know, line to line, back and forth, stop and cross over, start. A number of players stopped one way only. They had the habit. Well, that's a transference into a game, a habit, a bad habit. So I I would have everybody in a warm-up, Tom, and uh, I know Ryan did this, going for a water breaks with his U9 kids and U11 kids. He had them snow plow, right foot, left foot, two foot, on the way to the to the bench to get their water, just to feel that inside edge, to slow down controlled skating. And to me, that's what Alan has done. He's researched it, the biomechanics of it, and in an era where we were taught those fundamentals, a stick length is just unbelievable, a simple biomechanical fact of science of development. And it's something that parents and coaches have trouble reinforcing and selling. So, and Alan's going to try to come on. His health isn't 100%, but his brain is 110%. So I just want to capture it before um, he passes on like me and, and we capture what we're talking about here because everything we're doing and talking about, he deals with and he prevents those issues from happening because he's doing things the right way at a very young age and is getting parents to buy in. So next week, I'm hoping Al and I get hooked up and things get cooking there. But that's, I was hoping he would be on the day and we'd be able to get into that. But I had uh, nothing, nothing really else on, on my agenda or any challenges or questions or quirks up here we're we're getting our university playoffs going and uh, I'm going to watch uh, Carla McLeod uh, play the University of Regina and I think it's her the first year she's qualified for the playoffs with her team and um, I'm just looking forward to that so much but um, um, your game last week um, I, I can't believe how well the girls played. You've been tracking passes, and I think you all passed that team about 48 to 10 or something. But the, the one goal you described, talking about triangulation behind the net, it was incredible. So could you describe that? Uh well, it was just, we got the puck in deep and went east to west behind the net and right to a player in front that was in the net. And uh, Cassie had talked about, you know, trying get, you know, playing in triangles before that. And, and that's one thing we found out with, you know, how the girls, they, they love to tuck, you know, stick handle about three times, get the puck way back and shoot. They shoot it over the net so often because they just want to get it high. So, uh, we're working on doing that after the initial rush, getting the puck behind. And our last practice, uh, Cassie showed them shoot off the inside foot with a you know snap down. There was with no dust. Well, we played games with no dust uh, the last practice. And uh, Jim went over the offensive triangle, just the old offensive triangle, just so they got this concept. And tonight I'm going to. Uh, after the initial rush, I want them going east to west behind the net and the F3 mirroring and, you know, the first passer step out far post, the weak side D jump up to the other side. And I think that might solve our goal scoring problem because we outplay everybody. We don't outscore everybody just so that uh, they get the puck and they shoot it without dusting it off 25 times first. And... Uh, so we scored five goals the last game, which is incredibly incredible for us. The game before we dominated, we outshot them about 30 to 15, and our, and we were leading one nothing, and we, they scored with two seconds left, and our goalie was broken hearted. <laughs> she lost her shutout because it's another game. They scored with 12 seconds left, and she lost her shutout. But uh, yeah, so. Just trying to figure out a way that they can actually score goals, you know, the, the triangle and uh, mirroring the puck and 
all these concepts that we all try to get across to the players. So, anybody got ideas about uh, girls' goal scoring? I think all the quick release stuff you can do is uh, it's the way forward. The more they can master that, the better. Try to convince them that it's not, especially, you know, generally speaking, in the female game, most of the goals come within 15 feet of the net. So it's not, it's not how hard you shoot. It's more about how quickly you can release it to beat the goalies. Yeah, Cassie's going to play botch goal, you know, the two-touch game with them tonight. And see if they can catch on to it. It'd be interesting yeah. to see. I was just going to ask you if you've done that, um, you know, because we we uh, we used to do it regularly um, uh, with Danielle at the university, and it was really fantastic. And I, you know, I went out to uh, Vancouver uh, one year to to, and I was on the ice uh, practice with uh, uh, with. Um, with the Vancouver Comets, you know, Mark Taylor was their coach. Uh, he's a good friend from the old hockey days. And, you know, they have, they have a pretty skilled team. But w we did it at practice with them, and they caught on pretty quickly. I, I found it was helpful to get them going. Like when you explain the game that you can only touch it twice, then you have to pass it, shoot it. Um, to get them going, I, I would sort of cruise around and yell, one – to every time a player got the puck to help them get the idea but it didn't take much of that and then uh, we used to always tell the girls at U of C that you know the 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 keys in it are to move your feet as soon as you touch the puck move your feet and then as you're moving your feet if you can move the puck move it so move your feet move the puck and then the third thing kind of was protect the puck if you can or if you have to. And the fourth part was move to get open. That's the most important piece with the two-touch botchko is that I loved about it when I first did it with Thomas Pacina was it really puts a lot of pressure and emphasis on the off-puck players to get open for the puck carrier because they know sooner or later she's going to get into trouble, you know, and she won't have any touches of the puck left. So go ahead, Wally. Your your mic's off, Wally. Thomas and I, Thomas and I watched uh, their pro teams play this botchko, and I want Helen, Peter, and Jordan. I don't know if you've actually done the progression. But I don't start with two touch because the concept of Botchko, they stay out after a game, maybe six guys, and they play cross ice three on three. But you can only score off a pass. You can't carry it and score. That means you can handle it by time and space. You can't shoot it when you're carrying it. You got to just one time release. The next stage is two touch. The first stage of being able to carry it and get open, allowing them to handle it, is <clears throat> pivotal to the drill working, moving up the ladder. Now in two touch, they have to keep it on their forehand side and try to protect it and get moving and looking the receiver has to get open. They know they can, that person is looking for them. So those two stages are critical. The, and I thought, Hal and Peter and Jordan, if, if you haven't experimented with that game, it is one of those light bulb moment changing games where they have to pass. Not about toe dragging and trying to score yourself. And that's the biggest problem I think we face with all these individual skill people working with these kids. They can toe drag so well, they, they can't play the game. So, Hal, go ahead. Now, we use a, a, a 
a variation. I don't know if I heard it from you guys or what, but you know, they, they can only carry it for three seconds. And then they have yeah. to pass it because I've noticed in cross ice hockey, you know, they'll 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 do anything, they'll do they'll do everything they, you know, by themselves except shoot the puck. You know, they don't it, it's it's funny how that so we force them to not only move the puck, and then you can only you can only shoot off a one timer, and we only let them play for like thirty five or forty seconds, so they've got to get off. Um, but I, those are all such great drills, and you know everybody's involved, and sometimes we shorten it up, and we would put the nets. I mean, if, if you think about a cross ice game. And, you know, a kid's got a puck and he's somewhere between the nets and he won't shoot it. I mean, how many goals do you score from, I know, I know we score most of them from right in front, but I don't know my team scored a lot of goals on shots coming from the blue line, you know, which is 50 feet away. But you play cross ice and nobody wants to shoot. And um, so if I got to the point now where sometimes the goalie will shoot. You know, because they're only 30 feet away. So I, I encourage them to shoot the puck a lot and and try to get rebounds and try to get deflections. And because and I know I, the kids I'm coaching, um, they're still a little afraid of getting hit by pucks. Um, and, you know, it's not fun, but they get used to it after a while and that kind of stuff. So anyways, well, that's a great... Those are great options, and we just kind of change them around every day, doing um, just try to change it up a little bit so it's not the same, so they don't get bored. Um, I'm so. I'm uh, I'm anal on progressions, and I may be wrong here, but uh, I believe that three seconds is if they played. Score on a pass only, and they get the concept. Then giving them a time frame makes them hurry according to what you demand. Cool. So I wouldn't put in a three second rule until I saw they got the concept of looking and you saw players hitting the spots. Cool. And then in the two touch, it, it sort of is really out of the comfort zone because they can't handle it or they got to give up the puck to the other team. So, you know, I know you, there's three second games and two second games and, and whatnot, but I'm, I'm just looking to see if they're all getting the support concept of getting open and I'm watching uh, them play. When I saw Tom's team score a wing to win, uh, F1 to F2 pass behind the goal line, F3 on the slot, and scored a first goal of the game. I said, are you kidding me? They see each other. They see the ice. Two passes in a row for a goal. They get it. So everything adds up and's paid. Mm -hmm. The other th thing is, and I'm going to ask uh, Tim this. Tim, I always felt... There's a, a, a time to begin stressing uh, no dust shooting, no dust passing. And uh, I've watched Tom's team practice no dust so much now. They do it. They don't have to handle the puck. But years ago, I watched Tom with the midget team. They had to handle the puck because they were just banging it and slapping it. So this oh. progression of when do you teach shooting off the front foot so Tom, in this in this two on uh, zero one progression, I thought when they're going the other way, I just might have them work on shooting off the front foot to score or the pad, just shooting off the front foot. But I don't like adding. Massey did many, a progression last week on that. Yeah, but I don't <laughs> like adding too many details. I'm focused on the ability to go to the net, freeze the goalie shoot for a rebound, shoot to score or pass, play poker with the goalie. It's a hockey IQ drill. 
not a shoot off the front foot drill or thinking about too many things. So the art of coaching is, you know, right stuff, right amount, right time. And as Tim said, the right way. And so when I'm sitting there on the sidelines, just watching everything go on, this, this is what I'm trying to share. So the progress that, that, that both teams are making is absolutely phenomenal. And uh, they both uh, coaches take different approaches. One spends more time on deliberate progressive practice, which I do. And uh, Tom spends more time on letting the game teach. And uh, I think Cassie's that value because she's brought some focus on individual skill work that uh, that shooting off the front foot. I was really glad to hear that, that she's doing that. So I might put it to the test tonight when they take the second phase and go all the way down the ice to shoot on the goalie at the other end. Okay, Hal. Well, I think you're right. Um, I also, you know, you got to look at the players you have and what their tendencies are. And the reason we went to three seconds, because I had a couple of kids that will spend 45 seconds, you know, just dangling and toe dragging and, and screwing around. And so I had to force them. So the rest of the kids, you know, I mean, if you played with a kid like that, how hard are you going to work to get open? Because you know he's not going to pass it to you. And so you have to, with this group of kids, I had to do that. Um, and then <clears throat> as they get better at it, then we start changing, like you talk about, we progress the drill to a different level because now we've, we've sort of got this idea. And one of the things I always preach constantly is, you know, shoot on a moving goaltender. And and they all get that whole idea. And, um, <clears throat> you know, we've got to make that goalie move or, you know, the goalie's, the goalie's going to win that battle most of the time. And, you know, if people don't believe it, just look out the, the statistics on the, uh, on the shootouts in the NHL. Goalies win most of those battles. Uh, and they've got a clean look and they, and they don't, <clears throat> These guys don't make a move. It's hard to make a move when you're one on one, but but two on one, you should you should score a lot of goals two on one. But um, so, anyways, just a little more comment on top of what you're talking about. It's all good stuff, and I think you have to adapt it to the to the team you have, and the ability you have, and what their tendencies are. Good point, Al. Tim. Yeah, just uh, I I gotta I gotta run here, guys. I gotta zoom with Peter Smith. But hey, Tom, one of the other things I learned pretty quickly, uh, especially with the U of C girls, uh, Danish girls too. Like uh, if you're playing the two touch uh, botchko, uh, you know, with across ice or whatever, we always we always tell them like if you have a breakaway, have at it, do whatever you want. You can touch it as many times as you want. Um, but we do play the game telling them you got to score on a one-timer to help them get over. That's that's a little difficult with the two-touch. We usually just do that with a great, like we've talked about before, the regular cross-ice game, but you can add that in. But just, you know, if they get in a breakaway and they're only allowed the two touches, it's a little bit restricting and frustrating for them. So we usually add that. Good. Yeah, we have a whole progression of uh, like we kind of start off to get their heads up and get people supporting the puck that uh, there has to be at least one pass made in each zone. Like if we're doing full ice and we even combine with the other team and do that. And I have a duck call that I blow that if they don't make that uh, pass, the other team gets a puck and then go to the three second game and that can be you know, uh, in one zone or whole ice and two second game. And the last practice we had, uh, I like this game. The, the nets are at the top of the circles. There's two players in each team behind the net. They're jokers. And it was four on four. And they have to pass to a joker before they're on offense. And then that's kind of the template for the game. And that we added the rule, goals have to be either on uh, one timers or catch and release. So no dusting the puck. And, you know, that went pretty well. So I think, you know, and then I think the next progression is like Cassie wants to do the botch code tonight. 
So it's all a process as we all know, right? And every kid catches on a little bit differently. I got, I got a, uh, something I want to discuss. Hal, you had mentioned uh, the time limit and because of the player who dangled and wanted a toe drag and, um, you know, the, that's sort of the biggest dilemma up here, especially in guys hockey. They, they just don't know how to use each other. Right. And, um, but one of the things that I find that Alan Andrews does whole ice hockey U9 back in his day. Uh, and I think every one of you coaching at the level you coached at has had to go through this frustration. There's a player open ahead of you and they don't pass it to them. So Al Andrews with his U9 team has a head man rule. Tom has a duck call, makes them aware. But the head man rule sequence of delivery consistency is determines a coach's success in earning the trust and respect of the whole team for reinforcing the unselfish proper play of Ed Manning. So the steps are number one, before the season, before the first game, this is a cardinal rule. If somebody is open ahead of you, up the ice, we must head man the puck. Nobody can carry the puck as fast as you can pass it and don't slow down the game. The rationale, you can tell or sell or you can ask them, why do we want you to do this? And then when it happens on the ice, the first time is to talk to them to see if they're making eye contact and nodding in agreement to knowing the rule. The second time it happens, they're going to sit a shift. And they're telling the parents this rule that you've told the parents. The third time it happens, it could be a period. So the reinforcement of that is, um, that to me is the cardinal part of the game. They're, I love them dangling and toe dragging and they're doing amazing things. They're able to take risks that Heck, we couldn't even think of taking. We were going to turn the puck over. But there's situations where moving the puck precedes that. So, Hal, did you have another point there? Well, I just wanted to reinforce that because the, the player we've had the problem with, he actually ended up, we actually ended up uh, suspending him three or four games in the middle of the season because he just wouldn't play with the rest of the kids. And then he, he came back. And he's been better. And then we, we moved him to defense. And he's, he's a whole different player. And um, he's made the team better now because he's, he is skilled. He's got great hands and he, he sees stuff. But when we put him in a role where he, he has to move the puck, because that's his job now, he's made the team a heck of a lot better. But last night we played, and he we were behind, and all of a sudden he started to grab the puck and take off and go up ice. And he's you know trying to stick handle through two or three people. He gets knocked down, and then he trips the guy that knocks him down. So we had a little conversation after the game last night that that was unacceptable, and so we'll see. But yeah, I mean, I think we have we have to have these rules. And we have to enforce him. We forced him hard on him early this year. And yeah. he's, I don't know that he's reformed, <laughs> but he is when I'm in the locker room and <laughs> when I'm on the bench. So thanks, Wally. Hey, guys, I got to run. Thank you. Uh, look forward to catching up with you next week. Okay, Hal, take care. Have a good weekend. Yeah, you good guys too. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, My Michael, you are you still with us? Jordan, are you still with us? I Peter is. Jordan is. Uh, okay, I, um, I, you know, I this uh, dealing with things consistently 
and I call them cardinals. And uh, you can see my religious upbringing here on the cross behind my picture. Uh, the car, the word cardinal, it's it's sort of a reinforcement of something that's you know considered um, respectful and accepted. Um, I really believe at competitive levels, and Tom, you're not at a competitive level yet, but Madam AAA next year. If they're not moving the puck ahead, that, that has to be addressed. And they have to learn that. And right now, they're passing ahead of them more often than they have been. But they just don't quite at your age recognize people are open. And you know, there's a lot of players I found, and even about what Peter said about or Hal said about the player playing defense. Yeah. A lot of players see the players in front of them. Yeah. But they don't see players, you know, parallel to them. Yeah. People get two on ones. And good point. They good point. Yeah. Going up ice, but they, they don't take a look beside or behind them. Yeah. You know, to the trailer. And that, I think that's the next level of awareness is, you know, seeing players that aren't yeah. in front of them. Good point. You know, one of the things, uh, Peter, you got your hand up. Go ahead, Peter. Yeah, I think along, uh, I think along with that, what Tom's talking about is what I see is even at the higher levels, trying to teach the players to what, see through the layers, right? Right. They they yeah. see an opponent or they see their teammate, I should say, uh, in open space. But it takes time for them to learn to pay attention to what is in between you and that player. Just because that player is in open space doesn't mean it's a good idea to move the puck to them. You know, they don't see through the layers of where their the opponent may be in that passing lane. And likewise, the teammate perhaps doesn't see that, well, that I'm where I am, I'm physically on open ice. However, I'm not in a position where that player can successfully get me the puck. I'm not really available for that pass. I mean, I mean, you know, nice area, between being alone and being open, open, right? Yeah, right. Exactly. There's somebody in the way. So teaching them to see through the layers on both ends of it, uh, I think is, is uh, really important when you're talking about head netting that puck and making that pass, um, knowing the difference between being open, quote, like Tom's talking about, right. And, and being available, right. They're two different things. How do you teach that? Uh, I mean, we we teach. We've always taught it with uh, drills that include some sort of obstacle first, some sort of stationary obstacle. Like maybe maybe you might put tires or cones in a zone as they skate through, and they have to find a way to pass through through the cones, past the tire. Likewise, that player on the other end has to get in a position where they're stick is an actual target and it is available and then you begin to progress to adding that to your your small games your small area competitions where similar to what you're talking about like the sort of that uh, the, the kind of the two touch one touch passing where i'm catching it i'm moving it quickly well i can't move it quickly and someone else was talking about it i can't move it quickly if you're not in a position to receive it so it's it's actual the fundamentals i like to teach is with something stationary, so they get the idea that things are in the way, especially at the younger levels, and then uh, progress it, uh, progress it from from there. Yeah, Peter, I I I like the term availability because the Quebec Federation forty years ago created that term. We'd all been talking getting open, and availability is the same, really. They've got to see that you're available to pass to. So the teaching progression I recommend at a U9 level is a box support drill. And I've talked about it before. Three players standing 
in a box. There's four pylons about the size of a circle, the box, a coach in the middle. And they're passing. The players are handling the puck and passing to a player with the coach in the middle. And somebody has to move to an open lane to be available for the pass. And I have a video of it, a diagram of it. This to me is something Tom's team can do and it would benefit from. Wes's team could do and it could benefit from. It's almost too much of a regression. You can play these games and, you know, three second passing, but I think there's a a right time to do this fundamental thing, and it might be U9 or U11, but it's got to be done. No, I like that with adding the the play with the coach in the middle. I've done it with the cones, just with the rule that you can't pass diagonally through the middle. So someone always has to be moving with the four cones and the three players. Someone has to always be moving to an open spot in order to make that that lateral or vertical pass, but you can't make a diagonal pass. But I love the I love the thought of adding the coach to sort of force them to keep moving in order to uh, make themselves available. See, the good thing about that, Peter, when you just say diagonal, well, the guy's actually open. But when you stand there, are they open? No, they can see they're not open. So I coached the coach first in that drill. And I've, I've di- I did this with uh, Ryan at P3 Sports, and he wasn't accomplishing the purpose of the drill. They were passing, and the player was, you know, they, they didn't get it until he realized the progression is coach in the middle before, and then you can play pig in the middle three on the outside and one in the middle and they can move whichever way they want, but they got to be open. So that's what I mean by teaching progression. So when I do this two on zero, two on one tonight, um, I do it for the coaches, not the players, because the teaching progressions of the details that we need to pay attention to is going to determine what the, whether the kids get it or not. So that's what I'm spending all my time in. You know, I come from a generation here where that's all we did. We we didn't let them play as much. We didn't give them freedom. We taught them what to do, told them what to do. And uh, right now, like Alan Andrews said with his U9s for 40 years, we've underestimated their capacity to perform. So I, I really think we're just beginning to test tap into that reservoir of intelligence and it's, it's uh, a good time to be making change in the way we coach so michael how's life in your hockey world out there you're busier than hell no doubt yeah it's good i mean it's good to be busy i guess yeah it's uh been doing a lot of programming and it's a uh, silly season right now with people having tryouts and team selections and everything like that. So I'm trying to convince um, I don't know, maybe six organizations now to to eliminate the tryouts and to just do placements. Um, yeah. I, did a, I did a little survey internally with the organizations I work with, and I think on average it was about 5% uh, that, of, of, you know, kids that came for quote-unquote tryouts were out from outside the organization. Yeah. Like, you know, that weren't even, you know, that, that they maybe somebody, you know, they knew about the kid, but it wasn't somebody like, you know, it's not like there's 40 kids trying out for new spots. It's like two kids at every level. And um, so I'm trying to I, I was I'm trying to get them to understand that. If you want to retain more families and train more kids and just have a better experience that so, p- selecting the kids based off of their body of work is going to be better for the families and the kids in the long run. Um, you know, maybe going back to the earlier conversation about that resiliency, I, you know, I, I, I can see the argument a little bit that kids should have to go through a, you know, the tryouts maybe 
toughen them up a little bit and you know i don't know maybe maybe give them a sense of uh you know having to fight for something but i think you can accomplish that same thing at the youth level uh through evaluations and feedback rather than saying okay you 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 had this make believe 3 day tryout we're cutting you and we're not telling you why you're getting cut or how you're getting better or how you fit on the team I mean, I think that I think you can you could make you could manufacture a lot of that by saying, listen, this is the reason why we're not putting you on a team. It's because of these qualities. And we would love for you to see you reach these things in order for us to put you on a different team or with a different group. I don't know. So, yeah, and long winded, I, I, I it's it's been busy, but it's it's a fun busy. Peter. Yeah, Mike, that's that's super interesting. Let me ask you this. How how does this part fit into to that plan the kid that shows up day two or three of the tryouts because they didn't make the a team on the other program so they decide to show up for the tryout how how was that kid uh, accommodated yeah so we've been trying to work through like an evaluation process where it's not so much the three days that you see a kid it's more of a there's an application process and you say listen if you want to come to our organization just understand our our number the number one goal is the organization to retain their kids. So by saying that, we say we we want if you come here and we select you, we're so good at selecting, and we're so good at at, at understanding uh, the human condition, right? We we want to select you. We want to keep you. We want to develop you. We want to be the ones, you know. We're not going to cut you. We're going to make sure that you're you have a you have a place in our organization, and this is what we are, we feel you fit in. If you're coming from an outside organization, and I think that's that, that this is where the this is where the you have to weigh: Are you getting better by bringing in maybe a kid that's better than the kids you have, or are you diminishing your program by having a kid come and bump a kid that's been in your program? So, what we try to do is this: It's more of a what we we try, and actually locally, it's one of them is Paul in youth hockey trying to get them to be in more of an application process and a proactive process that says we've already selected our teams uh, based off of the kids that we've come into the program. We're looking to fill different roster spots based off of the kid coming in and it's based off a body of work and not on some arbitrary two day, you know, evaluation where the kid goes through a bunch of cones and, and does some skating drills. I, Cause I just don't think, I just don't think that's a great way for us to pick our teams. And I, you know, it's funny because that's how we pick the teams at the, at the highest levels of, of USA hockey in, in, in New York state, right. Is that you give the kids, you look at them for three hours and then try to evaluate them and say, Oh, this is the kids that should be on the team. And I I just don't think that's a great, I I just don't think that's a great system. So the, the, the places I can control the youth level piece, trying to get them to be more proactive in, in pre selecting the kids. And their tryout is actually the 25 weeks that they're with us. That's your tryout. So is, do you have direct, any direct comment with that? Is that on like their president of the organization, their hockey director? Because you're probably going to have some kid that's on a B team that the parents says, no, my kid should be on an A team. I don't agree with your assessment, right? right. That who, who, who is the bearer of that news? Like who brings that? So we're trying to get we're trying to get a, a lead a lead evaluator and then a director at every level. So eight U, ten U, twelve U has a director at that level, and that person oversees whatever major minor A B major minor and A B whatever it might be. That person and 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 to your point, that's what I'm trying to convince them that the same parent that's going to bitch about you not selecting them after three days is still the same parent that's going to complain if you place them. But if you place them. You're at least you're giving them the reason for the placement, not you weren't good enough, so you made the B team. It's it's this is where your deficiencies were, in our opinion, because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what your opinion is, because we're the ones selecting the team. We're the ones that have to work with your kids. We're the ones that have to put the lineup together. So I'm just trying to show the organizations to be to take the power away from the parent and put it back into the team selection process and run it almost like. You would if you were recruiting for a college program where, you know, obviously you would love to have a freshman that was the best player on your ice, 
But the whole idea is that when you come here as a freshman, I'm going to develop you through the four years you're with me so that when you're a senior, you're going to be one of our better players. And I think that that's that in the youth hockey world's lost that the youth hockey world is, is, is a six month cycle. It's six months. You didn't bet. You didn't get better. You did get better. I'm cutting you three. I'm keeping you three. And the cycle is, is around here, especially is, is just so, um, uh, destructive to the players and frankly, to the organizations. Like I, my job is to help organizations make money and the best way to make money is retain kids. And the best way to retain kids is to, is to, is to communicate with them and give them, show, take the power away from the parent and show them that you are giving them an, what you think is the proper evaluation, feedback and, and direction so that you can best guide their kid in the program. So is that something that if you're a parent and you're coming to that organization, is that a tool then for that organization to use saying, listen, we don't cut the kids. We we placed your son or daughter where we feel they should be. And we'll give you concrete evidence, reasons of why we feel that way. And then you do with that information really as you will. Right. As a, as a parent, you may, you're going to, you have your right to make your own decision, but understand that it's a whole year process to get to that point. And that's what, that's what we do. Well, I'm trying to show them that it's actually a, a, a six year process, that it's a, it's a, it's a funnel. You br- we bring you into the funnel from learn to play through eight U through 15 U. And then we graduate you off to your prep school, high school, junior A program, whatever it might be. But our, we feel that when we select you, when you join our program, our obligation is to keep you in our program and develop you in our program, not to cut you. And if you leave, you leave. I mean, and if, and if you don't like your placement, you don't like your placement. I, you know, you, you, it's the same process in school, right? If you, if you want your kids to be in all honors classes and they're not really ready for honors classes, you take a test and somebody evaluates whether they can handle it or not, right? Now, there are some kids that are very, very smart and maybe can handle an honors class um, because of, the, of, of a grade they got and because of a test they took. But then the guidance counselor, in this case, our hockey director or our program director, their job is to say, well, n- well, yes, you can you could be an honors bio, but is uh, being an honors bio going to drag you down in math, science, English and all the other subjects? So we we're going to we're going to make sure that you can't be in all honors classes because you can't handle all honors classes. So we are going to we're going to help you navigate that academic piece. And I'm trying to. I'm, I'm, my attempt is to get the youth hockey programs I work with to see it that way, that maybe you're not getting put on the top team because your development in this area is going to is going to be stunted or, you know, it, or, you know, you're not going to find the full potential of the kid. And by the way, this coach wants you. Like, it's one of those things, like, do you want to be on a team? Do you want to force yourself on a team with an organization, a coach that doesn't want you? Or do you want to place your kid on a team with a coach that really, that really values you and wants you? And, and that's, that's that. But again, that's, this is the age old problem that we're trying to solve right now. Yeah. How are they, how is that being received by the organizations? Terribly awful. Right. Because you've got board members, <laughs> right? Right. You've got board members. Because all the board members are parents and their kids right. are always the A kids. Right. So, so what happens is like, oh, well, I, you know, well, that, 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 that affects my kid now. <laughs> I'm like, well, I understand that, but we're trying to eliminate, we're trying to eliminate that piece. Right. And then you go to a bigger picture, right. Of, you know what, <clears throat> we have to talk about our board selection. Cause I have been involved with programs in the past where a board member's kid has been placed on a B team because that's where they fit. And the response by the board member was, I've been doing this for three years, so my kid could be on an A team. I quit. Where's my payoff? Like, how, this is my turn. Right, right. So that's why I ask how it's being received. So it's, unfortunately, it's, I mean, the, the idea is super interesting, but it's unfortunate that but people are looking at it that way. I mean, part of it is like, no, no I'm on the board. My kid, A, a player, I don't want to risk a situation where my, my kid's not going to be there. My kid's best friend's not going to be there, or well, whatever that may be. Yeah. Sorry, Wally. Well, I, I'm listening to you guys talk, and I'm saying um, 
th this is the perpetual issue. And I know how to solve it, but it's the leadership group, which is parents, that changes every three years, who begin with the right reason initially. Yeah. But over time, the human condition takes over. But here's the method, and I think both of you should write these things down. Because at a U9 level, whole ice hockey, uh, Carrie Brackle, who's been on before, in the Springbank community, which has 11 U9 teams, it just happened his boy was entering that age level, and another <laughs> friend he played with, and I coached both of these guys, their kids were in U9, and they took over that age group, 11 teams. They took over the evaluation process and the development process. So they, they, they brought in more knowledgeable hockey people on evaluation, but they evaluated three things that you should write down. Skill. Hockey yeah. sense and intangibles compete. Now, when you have your tryout, you mix everybody up, but they have three stations that they're going to go to. <clears throat> and the first station, the first day, is sort of a skill station and you place them and move them while they're doing the skill station. They're mixed up to begin with. And you move the ones that are obviously the most skilled stand out to the far end. So you might use two stations and move the very best to that other one so that all the parents can see who the most skilled are. And then you play some type of game. And you're looking at hockey sense. You're looking at decision making. It might be a game of Two versus two, possession. Who can keep it the longest? Who's completing passes? Who's getting open? And even though it's U9, they still play the game, and you can see who thinks and has skill that you might have let slip through the cracks. And you move them down to the most advanced station. And then you do compete. One versus one races, battling, working hard, out competing, not quitting, effort. They might not have the skill, but they, boy, do they try. And they might end up going to the middle group. And eventually you get create three skill groups, three groups on those three traits that you actually can score from one to five. When you add them up, you can pick your teams quite easily, but you've considered three qualities. So when they did this, they, they placed kids accordingly, 11 teams, and they practiced with those three stations, a skill station, Compete station when they pick the teams and a game station. And the kids rotated based on with their group. group. Even though you picked the number one team, there was still three groups within it. And they rotated through their stations with each group. So they did a skill station, a compete, and a game station. At the end of the year, well, before the season started, those two guys said, we need two number one teams. 
Of course, the board said, no, 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 you can't water them down. We, we only want one. Of course, they want to win the championship. So they kept two teams. And the SO Minor Hockey Week here is sort of the that time of year to find out whose programs are working the best in terms of outcomes. And actually, many of them are still learning to play hockey. So it's a crapshoot at best. But of the 11 teams, nine of them won their, uh, their division championship. And the top two teams they had in U9-1 played in the final. They got results. But the two guys never got their leadership positions back with the board the next year. But that, the selection process and placing them properly and even grouping them and developing them within their team, you know, it's it's a work in progress, but at least it, it's something to consider when you, if you, in your evaluations, the parents are going to change over and over again. The leadership group's going to change. So educating them on the process is, that's where we fail. Yeah. Because they're not going away. We're the ones that are stuck in the middle with trying to manage it, but. I don't know if anybody has anything to add to that process, Jordan, but you've been there as long as I have, and um, people being happy with what level their kids end up at. Um, what's your thoughts on it, Jordan? Well, I see Peter has his hand raised. I can respond after. What do you oh, have? Peter. Sure. My, my, actually, Wally, my question was, so... Those those gentlemen weren't asked back, so I'm, I'm guessing that's not the process anymore. Because honestly, if that was here, and Mike, you can please agree or disagree, but that was here in the states, that president or hockey director would have about a dozen phone calls that night. I don't understand why my son was in or daughter was in the middle group last year. They were on the 18. <laughs> it would it wouldn't be it wouldn't be that night. It would, be the dad, it would be the dad in the penalty box opening the door saying, no, 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 he's in that group. He's in that group. He's not with this group. I, I saw it. I just saw it and learned to play. I mean, I'm working with five-year-olds and I had a father freak. I, I thought the dad was joking with me. He's like, uh, hey, Mike, uh, my, my daughter's in that group. Oh, yeah. I go, okay, I'll, I'll get her. I'll, I'll make sure I send her down there. And I, I literally thought he was joking. And all of a sudden he's bellowing across the ice. Like my, your, my daughter is in the wrong group. I'm like, she's five and she can't stand up. I said, but. But Wally, uh, I'll, uh, Jordan, I'll, I'll, I'll let you jump in real quick. But um, I, Wally, I agree. So what, one of the things I'm trying to eliminate is we don't have a lot of Broncos here. And we don't have a lot of high. Like, so going back to I'm running, I'm running or I'm helping with organizations that have basically uh, parent run um, and, do, and don't have that. And the people that are doing these selections don't have the tools to identify a player's uh, other than the eye test, like, okay, this kid's better than this kid. Very, very clear. It's yeah. all those middle kids that are, that are missing. And what I'm trying to get them to understand is on, on, from a, from a business perspective is that the longer we can keep the communication going with the parents that we're educating them and uh, about yeah. where we feel the player is, then at the end of the year, when I take that player and place them onto the team that we've selected them for, I have a much better chance of selling the kids placement over a three day window of moving kids back and forth and up and down. And because like you're dealing with like nine and 10 and 11 year olds and down here, I mean, we literally have kids jumping on the ice on a Wednesday night for tryouts that are still in their lacrosse gear. Like they come in from lacrosse after two hours of practice, jumping on the ice and then asking to compete in a tryout, which isn't really even a tryout, because if you, if you, again, if you were, if you were working with the programs I'm working with, these kids are all selected already. There's, there's very few outliers. There's very few kids that are getting like somebody's like, oh my God, where'd this kid come from? Like, was he, 
like working out on a like some some barn on the farm and nobody saw him you know there's no young bloods down here it's it's everyone knows who the kids are and what my job is to say well how can we have a better experience for the parent and the kid and and but i but i do agree that there has to whatever the process is we've got to find a way to make it a process that doesn't roll over every time there's a new parent on the board sorry jordan no, I would echo echo what you're saying there, Mike. Especially the last part that uh, it is uh, when you have minor sports. It doesn't matter which sport it is; it's similar in that the uh, uh, who who gets themselves involved in a board are typically people who have some sort of investment, and and uh, it's uh, one of those things that yes, they may have started for the right reasons and. Uh, there are, but there are very few, like it's one of those things that you think about, uh, they can't turn off their parent hat or, or take off their parent hat or turn off that they're, that they are a parent because that's the way it is. Um, and so they become invested. Coaches become invested in their kids too. Like I, I look at the players that, that, uh, I've worked with over the years, I'm, whether I'm coaching them or not, I want them to go on to post-secondary. So do I get invested? Do I contact coaches or, or uh, have other people that I know that are close to coaches uh, contact them? Absolutely. And, and that piece. So, but it's the, the revolving door piece is a, a tough one. We've seen both. Uh, Peter, you were talking about uh, uh, when a player gets placed down um, a level. Well, you sometimes see the, uh, where a player who is uh, that of a board member's child uh, sometimes will get placed down on purpose by someone. And because they may have been overlooked by that, that person they feel in a coaching role at some point. And I've seen that and I'm like, I don't understand it. Why you would ever make a child pay for uh, a bad choice of, or, or what you perceive as a bad choice of an adult. And, uh, and uh I've had the, uh, this is going a different direction, but Wally and I were talking about this the other day. I had a situation where what I would have seen as tampering or meddling by an adult uh, with a player that was in an existing program to get them to another program. And I couldn't blame, or we couldn't blame the uh, 16 or 17 year old child, but we sure could uh, yeah. say that the adults that were involved probably uh, if they could have been held accountable in some way, should have been, uh, and that piece. And it's, uh, the purity of sport is not the purity of sport uh, when everyone is invested. And one last thing I'll add, Mike, is uh, I've found um, that uh, dollars also speak. If a parent spends more dollars, whether, the, whether it's a better experience or not, they'll default to, putting their kid where it's going to cost them more, it seems like. Uh, we had a hockey program at the high school where I had a former national team player uh, running it, and it was just a cost recovery because the teacher's cost was already paid for in the student's fees uh, or student allotment that we got from the province. So the cost recovery was on the transportation to the rink and the cost of the ice. So kids were getting 50 to 60 ice times uh, in a year. Uh, for the big expensive cost of $275. And we had parents that uh, uh, they would have a, a dry land thing on the go. And uh, they would say, well, my kid has to miss hockey today because they got dry land later. And all you'd find out was, well, they're paying the dry land guy 1500. And so they figure, well, we'll, we'll uh, forego one for the other. So it, it's not one world. And uh, I don't know that any of us will ever correct this. Uh, what I see as a, as a stopgap or a help is people like Peter or Wally or, well, Tom's still coaching, uh, but it, get people that have been involved in the game to get on those boards and, uh, or the ones that no longer have children in the association to get on those boards and put their volunteer time in after their children are done and do it for the right reasons. Yeah, there's, there's, there's no doubt. I mean, I think that's where, and that's where I'm trying to go, Jordan, is like getting, and that's really where my role is, you know, coming in sometimes as being just an advisory 
member of these organizations that I don't have any kids in and and just saying, listen, let's let the, I'm, I'm blind to who's on. I, I, I don't want to know who's on the board. I don't want to know whose kid has been here for 10 years. I don't want to know whose kid, you know, all I want to know is, is this is this a good kid? Are they OK in the locker room? And look, oh, wow, wow they, they can play hockey and, you know, and then try to help them place those kids. But at the same time, like I know for me, like I've looked at and Pete knows the area here, too, is like I've looked at my even the detriment to my own kid because I'm involved is that I don't put him in. Like I watch some players that are in these selection camps and and all these programs, right, that that I think objectively somebody would look at and say, well, this the, the, the Mike's guy, you know, the, his kid's a better player. But I just would never think to put my kid in there in that situation because he's not going to be the, the 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 top eight players. Right. So it's almost like, well, you know, I, I, I definitely get, you know, on the opposite way. I'm not pushing for my kid to get on the best team. Often I'm always like, oh, I don't know. I, I know all the kids. He's not one of the better kids in this group. And then instead of pushing, 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 maybe I should push more, you know, if I was outside of the realm. But I think overall, I look at this as, an, you know, for me, it's a project of, this is these aren't the you know these aren't the huge organizations that are getting 40 kids trying out for them it's it's local organizations that have 98% of the kids are from the town they've all grown up in the program there's no need to put them through another money grab tryout but i'd rather reinvest that money in development and tell the parents you don't need to try out it's still because i understand we want to charge whatever we charge I just think you can use that that ice time better and you can use the opportunity you have with those kids better. And and to Pete's point, if there's a kid that comes out from another organization, it's it's not that difficult to figure out where that kid might fit in in the pecking order. Um, now, if it's 40 kids, it's different. Like I, I joke around, there's a, there's two organizations down here, one that I would consider like a developer and one that's a compiler. And uh, uh, two years ago, nine kids from this one team went and tried out for the the big club, the triple A club. And all nine kids made it. So I'm like, well, why don't you just stay in the organization you're in? You're the whole team. <laughs> you you just went from you just went from a town program to paying five thousand dollars a year each. But nine of you made the team that only has twelve kids on it. Why are you going to the like? Why would you go to the other team? And but that happens down here. I, I and Pete, you've seen it right all the time. A whole exodus of kids will leave, go to another team, make the team, quote unquote. <laughs> but they're all. But they're like, well, you just just stay in the organization that actually developed you. But I think it's the, a, a lot of it's the organization's fault that they left because maybe they didn't communicate with them more and give that and listen to that level more and say, wow, we've got to in, we've got to make sure we're adjusting our our philosophy and what we're doing to the level of the kid that we now have because of how successful we have been at developing. So you can't just you know. If you're doing a great job and you're developing your talent level, you can't just maintain a status of, you know, tier three hockey to to the parent that 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 now has a kid that's perceived to be better than that. So you got to grow with it. Yeah, I think, too, Mike, I think a lot of and while he always talks about this is the importance of communication to a board board communicating to coaches, coaches being comfortable communicating with parents, parents being willing to to talk because it's such a bizarre thing to me. I mean, I've seen, and you've probably seen the same thing and probably the other guys too, someone who's incredibly accomplished, like a former National Hockey League player who's trying to give back to an organization, being told by a parent who never played the game before that they don't know what they're talking about. <clears throat> yes, that's 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 a tough one. But maybe some of that starts from communication from the top down of being willing to communicate, have these discussions, understand and just having an understanding of how the whole process works, because I think it gets very compartmentalized that there's coaches who, who just won't talk to a parent. Bottom line, will, won't communicate with them, um, won't have a good communication with a player as to why they're doing what they're doing. Parents don't talk to the coach. I think if we somehow it could become more open because at the end of the day, the process is supposed to be developing them athletically, mentally, socially, the whole ball. And 
you're not doing that when you begin to compartmentalize who can talk, who can't talk, how do we communicate if we're not communicating. So I think that's a, a bigger issue. I, I got a question in Canada, and I don't think Jordan and Tom have experienced this because they've coached the double A, triple A levels most of their lifetimes. But in what we call community hockey, when they don't make double A or triple A, they have in communities here, uh, and I'll just take um, a, a U15 age level. There, there might be 12 U15 teams in boys hockey. Uh, I don't know how many U15 teams there are in girls in terms of how are they tiered or are they just playing in one league in girls. So I don't think it's a, but in boys hockey, they have tier one, two, three, four, five, six, depending on the number of teams. And they might have 10 tiers. But here, and this is really interesting with the numbers, Michael, uh, they, they pick them, they play them, and then they place the teams at a different level. So I worked with a, a one game uh, with Dean Holden, asked me to run a practice he was away from. And he said to me, he said, we're, we're in the wrong division, Wally. We're, we're not winning. We're not getting clobbered, but we should be in the division below us. And when it came placement time, they were put in the division below them, below them. And of course they started to win and they didn't win before, but they were competitive, but they started to win and everybody was happy. One, they didn't want to go down. There was that sort of ego thing, that human condition of, uh, placement and being uh, rated a, a, a four now versus a three, but the kids are a lot happier. The parents have accepted it and they're a lot happier. So this <clears throat> idea, when your numbers get big, if that ever happens out there, um, placement of a team I don't know that your numbers are large enough, Mike. Well, the Connecticut Hockey Conference, so where we are in, in Connecticut, they do a reseeding. So what happens is you place your teams, you're getting, you know, and then they'll do, they'll, you'll get seeded after like the first month or two, they'll reseed those teams so that you can, so by the end of the year, you're playing in either, you know, division one or division five or six, depending on, you know, where you're at. So you could actually win a state championship at division five against the teams that are your ability. Like, so all the games in theory should be one or two goal games either way. Right. And I think that's a, I, I think the system that, 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 can, that the CHC has done is far better than like, there's another program right across the border, like the long Island league where you could literally lose, you could play games every weekend and lose by nine or 10 goals. And you can't get out of the division. Like you can't get out of that. It's, you, the, the programs get fined if you don't show up, if you don't play. So it's just detrimental to the development of the kids. But, but I like, but I like the reseeding idea and the ability to say, listen, this is who you are at this moment in time. Let's play against teams that are at your level, um, developmentally. And, um, it's just a better experience for everyone. How, how did that organization that reseeds do it? How were they able to accomplish that sensible process? So they have some algorithm that they've set up. Pete might know it better because he's in the state, but they they run, they, they you know, you, you you initially, you know, put yourself in the level where you think you're at, right? Mm -hmm. And and obviously there's teams that say, well, we're gonna go in the lower level because we want to win the state. So we're gonna we're gonna purposely go down a level. But then when you're clobbering teams, it just reseeds you. It makes you move up. It like it's going to push you out and and push those players down of uh, teams down based off of like competition. So if you know if team one played team four and 
beat them and then team two played team four and they beat them and team three played team four and they crushed them. It just re- it's always reseeding you. And then by, I guess, uh, probably mid-December, Pete, right, um, you start yep. to see the reseeding process happen. And then at the end of the year, like your last month, you're playing – you're playing teams that that they'll and they'll tell you they'll you know it's almost like the uh, the Corsi ratings right it, they'll tell you like what your what what the expected score should be the expected score should be a two goal game a one goal game a three goal game and then and it allows you to even be smart about how you're going to schedule outside teams yeah and it's not it's, I mean it's a good system for sure but like anything else it's not a perfect system yeah, right. Right, there's ways to get around. There's ways to manipulate it, and 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 you know. But again, for the most part, every kid in the state, every team in the state is getting to play some type of meaningful hockey at the end of the year. Yeah, no, for sure. I think that, and that's the benefit of it. Unfortunately, you have the whole thing uh, with the adults being involved, where those rankings Mike's talking about come out in, uh, let's say it's in. I think it is in December at some point. And uh, you find yourself at the top, we'll say, of Division Four. Unfortunately, it's not unusual to find um, another Division Four team that you're supposed to play on Saturday. Get a phone call: uh, we can't play because they frantically tried to find a Division Three team that they can play and beat in an effort to get bumped up. So it's a good, really good system. But it's like anything else. Once the adults get in the way. Um, it kind of mess, it can it can mess it up, but it's it the the intent of it is fantastic because like Mike said, most of the time you're where you belong, and every kid does get an opportunity to compete at the level that they where they actually fit. So if you can, they can, it yeah, becomes the it becomes the Bill Parcells credo, right? That you it, it, you are who your record says you are. <laughs> so if you say. Well, now we're a tier one team. Well, you're 0 and 18 against tier one competition. So you're no, you're not a tier one team. You might be playing in tier one hockey, but you're not a tier one team. So I think it's just a matter, you know, you are what your record says you are. And I think I think it um, I think the way they they reseed and place and and actually because of that process, Wally, I think teams are more apt to try to place themselves in the right place to begin with, because it's a nightmare to reschedule all these. You know, if you go out there and you say, oh, we're going to play way under our competition or way over our competition and you don't do your research as to where you should start the process of scheduling games it just becomes much harder for the scheduler right because now you're starting you're you're literally starting a whole schedule from scratch in you know mid-november so it is it is in the best interest of the schedulers to think about proactively where they fit in uh but it also helps that the algorithm helps you navigate that as the, as the season progresses. And when you say algorithm, and I'm assuming that the scale of assigning parents to just give a number for skill only, another group of parents to try to, what is hockey sense? What's a descriptor? What are they looking for? And a third group compete the character, the battle, the work ethic, make those evaluations as objectively as they can from what they see. It's the eye test. But for three separate qualities of character, intelligence of play, so the character effort is the most important piece because those kids that work hard and try hard are going to get better. And they may be the ones that haven't had extra started later. They may be more athletic, but haven't had a chance to develop. So when you do this placement, the algorithm of placement makes the idea of your tiering work better. Now, the ability of coaches to take their team and three skill stations, that's another thing. But we've created a U9 and U11 curriculum package. We had 40 practice plans. We cut it down to 10 and told them to repeat the practice, each practice three times. We'll do the same practice. The first time is you learn how to do it. 
Second time you learn how to teach within the, your station, with your age, with your, your, your group of eagles, hawks, falcons, or eagles, hawks, pigeons. Depends what they are. But it develops good coaches working with kids. And the uh, we've mixed three teams on the ice in three skill groups that were the same tier and right. ran practice that way. So the coaches <clears throat> are mixed up from each team working with kids at the same skill level. And ideally, the knowledgeable head coach might be running the skill station to teach. Or if you have enough, he might be the one floating to coach the coaches. I, you know, it's sort of an ideal world, an ideal achievement, but I think the, the idea of three traits and trying to numerically give them a number, it's going to develop better parenting in terms of awareness of it. It's not just their skill. They're going to have to apply yeah. it, and they're going to have to work hard to get it. And you're teaching life skills, which show up in the intangible one versus one compete station. So all good stuff. I, I don't know much to add, but the the Kerry Brackle, who I think, Mike, you've seen, be, uh, has been on yeah. before. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll update everybody on the his... His son, the team he's working with, uh, the AAA midget team, they they want to do uh, assign a mentor, the parents did, with more hockey experience to work with the head coach, and the board un unanimously turned it down. Hmm. And the coach is, you know, he's struggling, but the players have taken it upon themselves, and know what they have to do behaviorally is quit taking bad penalties. They are so skilled and they're starting to turn the corner behaviorally and they're, they're becoming a really good team. So they're at least enjoying the experience now where before they had inconsistent coaching, not reinforcement of behavior, kids staying out too long, kids taking bad penalties. And the it's it's working out okay, but here's a guy, his son started in U8 in this community where applying this selection process and creating two teams where they wanted one and both teams got to the final. Yeah. And he rolls the lines. He manages them really well. Everybody gets an opportunity to develop. I mean, I've never seen a better recipe for success. And uh, sometimes we've we got to get all the stars to align, not just occasionally. And maybe we can, as long as we're keeping talking about it, we can keep working in our little areas about it. And Tom, I, I'm, I'm going to um, interrupt you for a minute. And still, the bottom line to all of this, you guys, is the mission statement. Is what are they here for? That's the bottom line. Tom did it. He believes in it now because it's an enjoyable experience. Now, Tom, I've got two teams, and the parent groups are going to do this exercise together, even though one's already done it. And I'm changing the approach. But, Tom, I want Cassie to come into that meeting from the practice. So because she's a Hockey Canada board member, so she sees the process that's missing in any sport. The game needs that awareness because if we don't, if we just do it with those two teams and it's hunky-dory, what's going to happen next year and the year after? This has to become a thing that filters through the entire country at every level with coaches so anyway tom i don't know how accepting you will be of it but it's very important 
in my books because girls hockey Calgary is going to depend on its integrity is going to depend on this becoming an, a big part of how, the way they do things. Well, I don't think Cassie have any uh, objection because she do, she does mm -hmm. go to some parent <clears throat> things instead. Yeah. To be I with guess. me, she's you know. It, She's kind of uh, torn some some of the times because she loves being on the ice. Eh? Oh, she's really good. Did you I get gotta run? I got to run, guys. But uh, okay. thanks, Gr well, it was great listening in. Thanks, Mike. Robert. Thanks for the help. And uh, let me. I I want I want to see some video on the headset. Okay, I'll I'll get a tape just for you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, enjoy. George, you, you got to give me a chance to do one drill for you with the headset. <laughs> When are you flying out, Jordan? Tomorrow morning or evening? Uh, we're flying out tonight, tonight. at 6 o'clock. We play our first game tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Uh, their time or 9.30 their time. Where are you going to? Uh, out to that uh, Fraser Valley tournament, Tom. Oh, yeah, we went to that twice. That was a great. That's great. It's great to see something green yeah. after six months of brown, too. <laughs> yeah, although it's supposed to rain for three days while we're out there, but that was that was last year when I walked into the rink. I'm I was wondering, this is awful strange feeling. What what am I? Why am I feeling so strange? And then I was like, oh yeah, I've never been rained on walking to a rink before. <laughs> yeah, we were really lucky. We got these windows. I know the airport. I was talking to the lady at the and she said, these are the first days and three months it hasn't rained and we were there those days so kind of great yeah it's supposed to be sunny the first day of tomorrow and then chances of showers but no i'm looking forward to it it's one of those opportunities where uh i was talking with a parent last night uh about it that when do we get the chance in life to challenge ourselves against uh stiffer competition with no consequences other than to learn yeah and well, I know we did pretty well in that, and and sometimes we got spanked, you know. Yeah, and that's that was our response. Prep teams and stuff, you know. Yeah, that was the exact same thing for us last year, and and but it was the time where the kind of the light switch flipped on for many of our kids about how heavy of hockey that they could play, how big and strong they actually were, and how close they were to actually being able to play at the AAA level right then. And it's so usually I think. I think that that would be the same contest, eh? Yeah. Like you're saying, it's a grit. You get there on the boards and you're playing whatever and the other player just taking your stick, boxing you out, you know, and they're, they're there to win the battle. And, you know, that, yeah. that one of the biggest differences, not how fast you skate and all this kind of stuff. Peter, uh, just for Peter's sake, if he's still on, uh, they uh, they both coach uh, U18, double 18 girls teams, but they're going to a triple A tournament in BC. And they're going to get spanked by some and compete with some. And it sort of is a divining de developmental program for both of them. And I know Jordan, uh, I talked to a parent after the last game, Jordan, that said that that tournament will for you guys was the most important turning point of the season because I think you went undefeated after that. Yeah, we did. So, yeah. and Tom, uh, your, your team did very well. I think it won the provincials after that tournament. Yeah. And, you know, I think the, the theory of how good one is, is you don't know until you push yourself. So it's the idea of realizing the potential to be better is there. Regardless of the level you're placed at, you can strive to get to the next level. There's nothing wrong with that. But it's the word that's come up again and again and again is process. So that tournament is a critical part of the growth process uh, for the coaches do, going into the heat of fire and coping with the parents who maybe have never realized it before and how you were able to communicate the, the purpose of what you're going to learn from the experience. 
it's truly an opportunity. You never win or lose. You either, you know, you either win or learn. And uh, you're going to learn a hell of a lot. And Jordan, I got to remind you to send me the link for, so I can watch the games online here at home. Yeah, I just I sent them this morning to you, Wally, so they should be there. Okay. And look forward but, to uh, reading. The other your- big learning that will happen this weekend, Wally, is uh, uh, because we play in a junior A rink out there, uh, that uh, the benches on it, you can't pass behind one another in. There's not enough room to pass behind. So they have to jump the bench. And that's always the fun one for the first game because they never jump benches here because the boards are always too high in many of the rinks. And so it's uh, that that was a real learning curve for them last year that we didn't expect, <laughs> but uh, it'll be fun. I got a story about that. We went to Finland. I took the Mount Royal women to Finland. We were playing a pro team in Helsinki and there was only one gate. You know, they change in fives because they dress 22. They change in fives. And the girls are trying to jump the bench and they're hitting the ice. They're falling down. And I was just, I was just laughing. It was just, they had no idea how to pop onto the ice. I had one Tom last year that dove into the bench to get off the ice. Um, (laughs) It was kind of funny. Her teammates are catching her. She's diving into the bench and the other one's going out the door. And oh, it was funny. But, uh, but uh, the second period long change will be uh, will uh, have an extra wrinkle because of jumping the bench. I got a question. Do any of you have your players stand up all the time on the bench? I know some coaches do that. Peter? No, we always we always have them uh, set. I mean, especially at the at the higher levels, right? Because the, the simple fact is uh, they're pretty big and you're, as a coach, you're trying to see what's going on. Uh, so, so just a simple practicality piece of it. Um, the other one is it looks orderly and neat and it's easier on the line changes too because when the players that you're changing for are standing, everyone has a better idea of who they're actually changing for and where their space is on the bench. So it makes things run a lot more seamlessly, I found. Just, uh, this is something that came up in one of the games uh, I was watching with uh, um, the U13 girls. Uh, the, the changing, the, the management of the, the bench door and who goes out and who comes on. And I think generally speaking, my only methodology was is stay out of the way and let the player on when you arrive. Has anybody done anything different or had a different method of making changes more effective for themselves other than don't try to do two to fit through the door? (laughs) Peter, Tom, have you even thought about it? when, when When they were little, because it was actually physical room for players to pass in front of each other on a bench because yeah. they were small was out this door in this door. Okay. So that, that worked pretty well. But again, that's for the younger players, just because of their physical size, they're able to, you're able to navigate that. Once they get bigger, that doesn't work. Tom? Well, just have them, like you said, you, you let the player on before you come off. It just gets, uh, a rally when someone passes the puck right into it and you're changing and you got a puck coming and you, you know, have a player trying to come off and a player coming on and it's getting in skates and, you know, so that's when it becomes, uh, you know, everybody's yelling, don't touch it, don't touch it. And some players just go grab it. And Yeah. Jordan? We well, talked- it, depends on the, if, it depends on the official on that one. We had one the other day where, the player coming on touched it and the other player wasn't off and they're and but was stepping in and they're like oh no that's okay whereas we had uh, an official the previous time that our player had one foot on the bench when the other player touched the puck and we got a, a too many players penalty so but yeah i usually want the player going on first and and the other one coming off and and depending on where the puck is uh on the ice you cheat it that uh a player will 
take the other player I know legally is supposed to be 10 feet from the bench, but you can have that other player jump if the puck is going deep in the far end and and you can have a player jump and tell them go straight for the puck and the other player is getting off. It's like the old Edmonton Oilers uh, back check where the player coming back would just stick his stick in the air and somebody be hopping off the bench 20 feet, 20 feet away. And, uh, so that piece, but it's just that awareness piece that way. And I always give my backup goaltender a hard time that uh, any too many players on the ice penalty is on them. So uh, that because they're running one of the doors, <laughs> but. Uh, Do you think that there should be, that rule should be eliminated? No, I think that blatant uh, use or person jumping on and playing a puck uh, yeah. can't be there. But I also made the argument with my old school basketball coaches when I was at the high school that that would be the best way to change basketball would be to change it in the fly. Yeah. <laughs> he or she didn't really buy that. <laughs> I think no, hockey, no. Wilson the only and Utley didn't think that was great. Yeah. It's such a well, process of soccer. You got to come over and you know you get the ref's attention because there are no kind of whistles except yeah. you know they're very seldom. Yeah. Well, I I've uh, I've got a question here at the NHL level. Watching all the games, so many goals are scored on scoring. Chances will occur on bad changes because the numbers are taken advantage of. And at your level, Peter, coaching college, and I don't know, Jordan, yours or Tom's, whether you even have to address the change in terms of coming off fast, take advantage of a proper change. Well, I found, Wally, that having the parents, like we have two parents that wanted to coach and they do the door. And sometimes they get the change so much in their in their brain. Some players in a critical area, you know, like back checking on two-on-ones, and they're yelling at them to come off the ice. Or they might be on a two-on-one on offense. Yeah. They're screaming at them to come off the ice. And I, I know I've talked to them and said, you know, you to read the situation if they're if they're involved in the play you can't bring them off the ice just to change you know so you know, tom i i was i got to do your door and work with the defense one time and i loved it because i could talk i love the door because you can talk to the players you're right down at their eye level bending over to open and close the door and there i had a chance to coach because i'm talking to the defenseman and how hard it was to change. And there was an opportunity to change, but the D stayed out longer. It got extended. And I just talked to the defenseman here. There's an example where she could have changed. Yeah. And she stayed out. We were already at the 42nd mark. Well, if, if uh, speaking of that, if, if Jim and Cassie are both there, yeah, I don't see much point in me standing between them you know on the to see above everybody I stand right at the board right at the boards between the forwards and the D yeah. so I can see the corners because you can't really see him standing back there and yeah. if I things you know like light, light things to say I'll talk to them there yeah if else like the last game I I said Cassie can you talk to Olivia about you know this and I showed her give it and she talked to her when she came back to, tends to throw it right across the middle of our zone on the backhand, which is yeah. never, yeah. and, you know, yeah, so Wally, I was going to say that, yes, we do have to talk to them about changes and, and lots uh, because uh, they're, they are crucial times where they will end up in goals scored against, uh, especially that long change in the second period uh, and awareness of uh, sometimes changing early rather than, uh, getting hemmed in in your own end. Uh, the other one is always, that's really the most important period of, uh, you always hear people saying dump and change. Well, yeah, you can dump and change, but one person has to pursue the puck. Otherwise it's a free breakout 
and and uh, especially in that long change that can be a free stretch pass breakout that all of a sudden they have numbers at your own blue line as people are scrambling to get on the ice so yeah, uh, dump and change and they have like a three on one yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah be aware of the numbers you have yeah see tom i'm i'm listening to what you said where the coach is yelling change and they shouldn't. So, Jordan, I'm throwing this at you. Would you have your coaches run the door, let the goalies stand back for to learn how to the importance of changes? They're, they're going to do the door for a game, focusing on changes. Because I found, boy, I could really be positive and coach and encouraging, opening and closing the door. And there was the next two D up. It was just amazing to be able to talk to them, to ask questions to them. So it's an opportunity, like for me, really to interact with the, the, the two players. But if your coaches had, were given the door and you're monitoring shift length, change opportunities, Coaches have to be aware of it to make the players aware of it. I, I think it's a, you know, pretty good idea. And I don't know, Tom, whether your parent coaches, have you had a conversation with them about changes? Oh yeah, I've I've talked to them, and we even flipped them around because uh, one one parent's daughter playing forward. Every time she came off the icy beat, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? You know, and. Uh, so I just flipped him around so he was taking care of the D. But I, I've talked to him, but it, it's a way for the parents to be involved. I, I prefer, you know, I prefer the players to be open. The, like at the higher levels, I have the players open the gates. But these kids are only. Yeah. You know, a, simple, a, a simple kind of strategy tactic that I've used that works pretty well, especially at the, the college level, because they just have a, that ability to do it is not just the errant dump very often our guys know our guys know or knew when i coach that when it's time for a change one of you is going to stay on and the player that is facilitating the change with the movement of the puck very often flips it to the opponent's goaltender so now that goaltender has to hold that puck evaluate the situation do they move it do they not move it with that other player on our team knowing that that's what we're doing we've got many many in zone draws that the goaltender just chose to freeze a puck because they had to make a quick decision as opposed to just dumping into a corner where a d can swing gain the net look for a breakout pass start to move their feet so that's a tactic that we use that, that has worked very well peter uh daryl belfry i'm going to throw this at you why not pass it to your own goalie? I think it depends on where you are, you are on the ice. I mean, I'm, I guess what I'm talking about is they've gained the red line. And at that point, they're, they, they know they're going to attack. I mean, certainly you could, you could give it to your goaltender, but if you aren't able to move the puck in a precise and quick manner, now you've given your opponent zone time in your zone for a for a face off as opposed to I'd rather be in the other zone, honestly. Yeah. Yeah, but you have possession. So this is where Daryl Belfry says nobody's doing this. And that's an extreme. But the idea of possession changing is sort of his mantra right now. And let the other team get caught out there too long and you're fresh. And I've never, ever thought of it five on five. But when I ran conditioning camps with uh, 30 pros, two teams of 15, they changed on the whistle, but they had to pass to their goalie. Yeah, and I think part of what, what you just said is part of the key is uh, a little bit is going to depend upon how skilled those individuals you are at because you said pros. So it depends on how skilled how skilled the, the, the kids you have, the players that you have that you're working with are, 
Uh, certainly you could do it. I mean, I think I think every so often, like I've, I've seen it happen naturally, if you will, intuitively by the players. Yeah. But it's nothing that we've ever used as a mantra because, I mean, I could see it where back to the goaltender, um, goaltender moves it to a D, maybe you fly an offside uh, forward and you try to hit him uh, on yeah. a breakaway. I mean, I, I think, honestly, I think that would be a really great tactic to maybe utilize if you're um, down a goal in a game later in a game or later in a period when you feel like the other team is a little bit uh, fatigued, for sure. Okay. Well, two hours, 25 minutes, guys. And I, uh, I'm i going to be at practice tonight, Tom. I'll make sure the mic's operating. Thanks for the opportunity. And um, thanks for joining us, Peter. Really enjoyed having you. Uh, I'm working on Alan Andrews being on next week because everything we're trying to do, influencing parents, and affecting players is what he's able to do because he's got this enterprise of influence, which really is, he has all kinds of graduate coaches that coach that way that are working in communities in this province and neighboring provinces. And the philosophy is the same when they go through his program. So it's permeating uh, many more teams in three provinces uh, than probably any of the pro provinces in Canada. So, okay, guys, we'll uh, chat with you again next week. And Peter, have a great weekend. And you do the same, fellas. Good luck in your your games and your involvement. Okay, take it care, everybody. Golden tomorrow, so I'm hoping it doesn't snow because it's right. the uh, worst part of the Trans Canada Highway in the whole country. Right yeah. in the middle of and it's going like <laughs> if I'm alive next week, I'll be here. Uh, Are you driving yourself or are you and your boy going? Uh Jim's coming. Okay, well, wish them well and hope everybody drives safe. Well, a lot of them are leaving right after practice tonight. Yeah. They're going to go uh tubing in Golden tomorrow. I guess they have some tubing place. And the ski hill. Team building. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, you know, it's some of them. So I guess Cassie's not working tomorrow so she can go. But the kids are all off school because it's teacher's convention started today. Okay. So teacher's convention. So they'll do that. And we just play Saturday, Sunday. And family day is Monday. So I wanted them. I said, well, why don't we do a bus? It's a lot safer. Yeah. But but the deal is some want to go up early and then other people are going off to all kinds of different places when our tournament's over. Yeah. So they want cars. So, uh, 